Good morning, and welcome to Centennial Presbyterian Church, Virtual Worship, July 19, 2020. Please join me now in the call to worship. Father, Son, and Spirit, we worship you today. Father, we celebrate that we are your children. Son, we celebrate that you have called us your sisters and brothers. Spirit, we celebrate that you dwell within us. As we come to worship you, we recognize the beauty and complexity of the Trinity. We praise you that each part is real, alive, and present. We sing songs to celebrate your truth. Father, Son, and Spirit, we worship you today. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our worship this morning, and God bless you, and peace be with you. After the service, we'll have our Zoom coffee hour at 11 o'clock. Please join us. Let us pray. Creator God, in you we live and move and have our being. You alone have been our help and guide through good times and bad. You alone give us the strength we need to face the challenges around us. You alone will be rest for our bodies and souls. To you we turn for wisdom. In your presence we will find the peace and comfort we long for. Fill us with your spirit in this time of worship. Open our minds and hearts so that we may see as you see, love as you love, and follow your ways for the sake of Christ our Lord. God, who sees and knows our inmost thoughts and our thoughtless actions, the truth of our lives is this. We are often impetuous and do not seek your wisdom. We are often stubborn and do not practice mercy. We are often arrogant and do not act with love. We are often anxious and do not trust in you. Forgive who we have been, amend who we are, and direct who we shall be. For the sake of Christ our Lord, we pray, and we pray as he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, dear friends, remember that God is slow to be angry and quick to forgive, kind and gracious to all. Know that your sins are forgiven through the grace of Jesus Christ and forgive those who have sinned against you as he taught us. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are you this morning? This morning, are you afraid of anything? Or are you worried about anything? I want us to start this morning reading a very special verse from the New Testament. In 1 Peter 5.7, we read, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let's talk about this scripture for a few minutes. First, do you know what anxiety is? The dictionary says anxiety is also fear, worry, concern, and unease. So if you, if you have felt afraid or worried, raise your hand for me. Of course, everyone experiences these feelings at some time or other. At this moment, Everybody is worried about getting the coronavirus and get sick. So we carry the mask and we put a mask on when we go to different places and uh, they put distance between each other. It's okay to be afraid. God made us this way so we would know when there is danger. But not everyone is afraid of the same things. Those things we are afraid of are very real, and we should not make fun or laugh at our friends for having these fears. There is something we can do. We can let God help us. We can tell God our fears. We can pray when we are afraid, because God is a loving God who cares for us. As Christians, we have the gift of being able to turn our problems over to God. God will listen to your worries and He may even help you with them. But you need to turn them over to Him. God can help. Do you have any worries or are you sad about something right now? If so, let's take them to God in prayer right now. Let us pray. Dear God, we have some worries today and taking them before you. Thank you for helping us. Amen. First scripture reading for today comes to us from Psalm 103. We'll be reading from the verses 1 to 12. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he have out his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions. From us. And our second scripture reading for today comes to us from 1 John chapter 5. We'll be reading from the verses 1 to 10. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father 
loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for every one born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which, is, which He has given about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. This is the word of the Lord. I'll begin my sermon with a story by Lillian Holocom, Pueblo, Colorado. At bedtime, I tell our two grandsons a Bible story. One night I said, tonight we are going to talk about sin. Do you know what the word sin means? Seven-year-old Keith spoke up. It's when you do something bad. Four-year-old Aaron's eyes widened. I know a big sin Keith did today. Annoyed, Keith turned to Aaron. You take care of your sins, and I'll take care of mine. The first, we need to take care of our own sins. The gospel is never, first and foremost, about someone else. It's always about you, about me. It's both easy and common to lose this focus. We like talking about other people's sins rather than our own most days. We like hearing about messes other people have gotten themselves into without ever thinking that we are in the same shape. When you watch movies, talk shows, soap operas, crime stories, we feel sorry. We feel pity for the victims and we feel indignant. It's horrible, but that kind of religious response is worthless. It can't make even minor difference in our lives. Gospel, good news becomes good news when we admit that we are the sinners. What's wrong with the world? A newspaper editorial once asked G.K. Chesterton, wrote in reply, I am. What is sin anyway? Sin is basically playing God. Sin is acting like God. God is the creator. God is the provider of everything. God is the judge. What is sin? It's a denial, ignorance of this basic conception. Sin stories, after a while, tend to sound pretty much alike. Have you noticed? The precise details of our sin may be different, but the presence and recurrence of sin are the same. We want to be God ourselves, take charge of our own lives, assert control over the lives of others. The subtlety of sin is, it doesn't feel like sin when we are doing it. For a while, it feels God-like. It feels satisfying, fulfilling for the time being. Remember David? When he committed adultery, he felt like a lover. When he sent people, sent orders, he felt like a king. 
It's a replay of the episode in Eden when the tempter said, You shall not die, you shall be as gods. The less we are paying attention to God, the more we are acting as if we were God. The more we, the less God. We think, we think that if our sin is taken away, we'll become less. What happens is that we become more and better. So, we need to face our sinfulness honestly. Forgiveness requires recognizing sin. The fact is that we are sinners. 1 John 1 a says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Recogni recognizing sin is realizing our position before God. A sinner. A person in trouble. A person who needs help. A human being who needs God. The moment we recognize our sin, the gospel story develops out of the sin story. When we recognize sin, what's the next step? 1 John 1, 8 If we confess our sins, He who is faithful and just will forgive us, us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, in a nutshell, is the good news of the gospel. So, the next step is confession. Every addiction recovery program, every Bible story, every repentant heart starts with an end to denial. I am the sinner. I believe that God knows we will mess up. But I also believe that God longs for the heart that says, I blew it. Confessing our sins is not an act of despair, but one of hope. Why? Because confession serves as the hinge that enables the door of God's grace to swing open. Fred Buchner puts it this way. To confess your sins to God is not to tell him anything he doesn't already know. Until you confess them, however, they are the abyss between them. When you confess them, they become the bridge. In the words of Eugene Peterson, Only when I recognize and confess my sin am I in a position to recognize and respond to the God who saves me from my sin. Now, Peterson also says, It's always a mistake to concentrate on our sins. It's God's work on our sins that's the main event. Our sins aren't that interesting. It's God's work that's interesting. There's nothing glamour glamorous about sin. And it to the devil's work to make it look otherwise. Sin is diminishing, dehumanizing, and soon dull. After it's been recognized and confessed, the less said about it, the better. We have a finite number of ways to sin. God has an infinite number of ways to forgive. Sinning doesn't take much imagination. But forgiveness and salvation? That's a different story. Every time it happens, it's fresh, original, catching us by surprise. It's new every morning. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. It means we recognize our sins and we confess them. But still there is one more thing we need to believe in. That's God's forgiveness. Psalm 102, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. 
When God forgives, He forgets our sins. He clears the record. He erases the tape so that when He pushes the button, nothing shows up on the big screen in heaven. Our sins are forgiven, forgotten, removed, buried, and brought it out. They can never condemn us again. Let that thought grip our soul, and we will never be the same. But how could it be this way? How could God forgive us? Why doesn't he look at our sins? Here's the answer. A long time ago, God fixed his gaze on the cross of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are honest enough to admit that we are wicked and evil, a stream of mercy flows out from the cross of Christ, and our sins are covered by his blood. We discover in one shining moment that with God there is forgiveness. Why forgiveness? Why not punishment? Forgiveness, grace, is the thing that changes people's lives. Punishment can change our outward behavior, but it doesn't transform the heart. When we experience the grace of God, we find our lives changing and we want to live differently. If we confess our sins, He who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you believe in the forgiveness of sins? I do. This is the whole ball game right here. Everything else is just details. Isn't that right? The whole life of Christians is the forgiveness of sins. Karl Barth said, The forgiveness of sins is the basis, the sum, the criterion of all that can be called Christian life O Christian faith. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer you what we have and list a part of it. Thank you that your love is overflowing. Bless these gifts with your love so that their goodness will overflow to meet the needs of those who cry out to you and to us. For Christ's sake, Amen. Let me close our worship in benediction. Let us pray. May the power and blessing of Almighty God go with each of you as you leave now to minister to a weary world. Remembering to make good and holy choices that will channel love, compassion, and the presence of God to those around us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love. Amen.